Hello, my name is Austin Belzer. Welcome back to the Austin Beat Media Podcast. Today, I'll be discussing Dune Part 2 with my guest, Isla Ruby, editor-in-chief of Movies We Texted About. Isla also writes for sites like The Cosmic Cir- Circus, Offscreen Central, and Cherry Picks. For Hi, those guys. Who- Hi. And for those who haven't been ca- caught up on the podcast, we actually talked about another movie. We talked about Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse. I'll include the link in the show notes. So go check that out if you haven't. Really love that episode. We're both members of the International Film Society of Critics, which we just announced our winners. I have that list on the website. Just posted it a couple days ago as of this recording. So check that out. But Isla, welcome back to the podcast. Yeah, I'm excited uh, to be here. And I'm really excited that you mentioned our critics group because... I don't know. I, I feel like people really should go and check that list out on your website because we've righted maybe some wrongs and had some interesting picks there. Yeah, I think we're the only group that had Barbie nominated in a lot of categories, mm-hmm. but totally underperformed and <laughs> past lives overperformed. Yeah, I don't want to say overperformed, but it did very well. Every time I voted for it, I was like, oh, this isn't going to win. And then I looked at the winner's list and I was like, oh, it, okay. And something that shocked me actually from our list was Iron wasn't there, I don't think. Uh, and it, I was, was, it was, was nominated. It yeah, it was uh, nominated because I remember seeing it and maybe voting for it. But yeah, I, I was just really shocked that it didn't get any, any love given our chats. Yeah, all in, in our WhatsApp group chat for the group. Everyone, when it came out, people were talking about it. So I'm surprised Efron, who did get nominated, didn't show up anywhere. So Mm -hmm. interesting. But yeah, before we get into Dune Part 2, which for those wondering who haven't seen Dune Part 2 yet, like always, like our Across the Spider-Verse podcast, we're going to be formatting this in both, hey, let's just talk spoiler-free, and then we'll have a spoiler-filled section where we get to freeform talk about it without fear of spoilers. Obviously, before we get into spoilers, we'll obviously give our ratings and stuff like that, so that if you need to dip out, since you if you haven't seen part two yet, we'll give you that opportunity. But before that, Isla, is there any movie, show, album, anything you want to recommend before we get started? Yes, actually. And I think this podcast will probably air after the embargo drops today. So I just saw Kung Fu Panda 4, and nice. I'm, I'm going to talk about it later, too, because it, it, there's a connection to Dune somehow, believe it or not. But it was really cute, really sweet, and Jack Black is amazing, as always. So go see Kung Fu Panda 4. I'm going to shock everyone on the podcast right now. I have never seen any of the Kung Fu Panda movies. That's I, actually the Dune connection for me. I haven't either, and I haven't seen Dune. Oh, okay. Fresh eyes into the story. Maybe I should just go into part four of Kung Fu Panda and be like, I know nothing. Let be like that one commentator YouTube channel who only sees the first and last <laughs> episodes of everything. And except for this time, I'm just going in blind for Kung Fu Panda four. So you that totally should, hilarious. because yeah. it works, and I think that's like a real strength of the movie. Like they set it up so beautifully, and it it has this a whole new direction. And I think, yeah. You don't have to have seen the previous ones. It's not Marvel. You don't have to have seen, what is it, many days of your life watching shows and movies. Yeah, it's not like Toy Story 4, where you need to have seen all three before, and then you also <laughs> need to see Toy Story of Terror and, what was it, Toy Story that Time Forgot, Small Fry, all those. You mm-hmm. don't need to see all those. But I guess that brings us into our Dune Part 1, conver- Part 2 conversation, not Dune Part 1. <laughs> not Dune Part 1, but I mean, we can. But Dune Part 1 does play a role in this. Now, you told me that you have not seen Dune Part 1. Correct. I want to talk about that. Yeah, just let's just talk about that. Oh, no. Why? Right now. Yeah, why? It's clearly in Dune Part 1 that there is a Part 1 at the opening titles and then (laughs) this Part 2. So what made you want to see Part 2 but not Part 1? And we talked about in the pre-show a little bit about time. And we, we talked about Invincible. We talked about the brother, son. There's a lot of stuff out there. And for me, I didn't see Dune Part 1 in 2021, I think it was. Just, I guess it was a yeah. pandemic. I don't know. I didn't see it in theaters. And I just never made the time to see it. 
at my house. And then by that point, it had gotten so far away from me that I just wanted to go and see the new one. Yeah, I. It, it's interesting because I, the only way I've seen part one is at home. Mm-hmm. I saw on the then called HBO Max, now called Max. <laughs> Um, It'll have another change, another name in a couple of days. Just wait. Oh, I'm sure. CNN Max Plus <laughs> minus one. Yeah, I, I saw part one on HBO Max on a 1080p screen. It was, or m- maybe it was on the screen. I don't know. And I wished I had seen it on a bigger screen because oh. we'll talk about it later on um, when we get to the IMAX section. Because that's how I saw part two is in IMAX. Yeah. Because I think the screen's 29 by 35 meters. Uh, it's massive. It. Yeah. It's one of those true IMAX screens, but we'll get into that later. <laughs> I loved part one. I wrote, I forget the exact word count, but it's over 2,000 words. It's my longest review wow. in the history of, of my reviews. I love it. I specifically talk, I did a lot of research for that. Ironically, though, I didn't read the book. I just did the 1984 David Lynch movie. Oh, with Sting, um, right? Th- with Sting, yeah. <laughs> and then watched Dune Part 1 and then did some online research for, for my review of Dune Part 1. Also, Overdrive, could you could my library just give me the audiobook of Dune? Why do I need to wait for the <laughs> audiobook? It's a digital file. Just send it to me. But yep. anyhow... And I think a lot of that criticisms, go back and read the review for anyone who haven't, hasn't seen it, that a lot of my criticism or praise for that movie re- revolves around the religious con- connotations of it, the Islamic connections and things like that. So I was really expecting more of that in part two. And wow, uh, I was not let down. <laughs> they go in on it. That's a but function. Yeah. And I know you have got the, the book yet right mm-hmm. there. But I think that's a function of how Herbert wrote it as well, because he wanted to connect to this grand sci-fi epic to modern conflicts and modern, like, mod- I guess, modern at the time for him issues that are still relevant today. Yeah. And, but yeah, I went into part two super stoked to see what they did with how part one ends with this is only the beginning and that tease of, okay, what's going to happen next? Because again, the only context I had was the 1984 movie, which is famously rushed. Things happen <laughs> in part two that happened just in the first Dune Lynch movie. Do you have any other experiences with Dune outside of this? We, I think we, we talked about it a little bit. So I had seen the 84 movie. Oh, that doesn't feel like 1984. And then I mentioned Sting as the, the equivalent character. Someone we'll get into later on. I don't think it's a spoiler, but yeah. I had seen the older science fiction stuff and I wasn't terribly impressed, sadly. Mm -hmm. So maybe that impacted a little bit about my hype for this Dune. When I had read the first book, I didn't read all of the six Frank Herbert books. I think there are six. Just so I just, yeah, I just read the first one, which by the way, I love that you plugged Overdrive in your library. I think everyone should go use their library because amazing resources, but that's not related. Yeah, I'm still waiting on those Percy Jackson audio books. But one uh, day. But one day. I just wish Overdrive would fix their system a little bit. So if it it'll recognize that, hey, this is a audiobook and a series of audiobooks. Don't send me the last book in the audiobook yeah. first. Send me the first, then the second, then the third. But yeah, use your library card. It's really, it could save you a lot of money. Canopy yeah. is one of the best streaming services out of there. So and it comes TV free. Shows and movies too on there. And it's just amazing. But Dune isn't there. I don't think the 84 version is there. Um, I don't know how you'd find that if it's on Prime or Netflix. At this point. I think it was on Hoopla is where mm-hmm. I watched it. Okay. Um, either that or I just rented it. But I knew some version of Dune is on one of the streaming services that my library provides. Oh, even better. So I guess, yeah, I think the 1984 version really contributed to my lack of maybe excitement for the first Dune (laughs) and this too, which is sad, but that's how it goes. Yeah, I feel like after watching Dune Part 1 and then watching the 1984 David Lynch version, I'm like, oh, okay, so there's no way Part 2 could be worse than this. (laughs) Good. (laughs) Awesome. So it's a pretty low bar, 
but beat it all expectations. Yeah, I, I don't think I needed to. Yeah, I, I if I say what I want to say, it's a spoiler. But <laughs> it's so hard. I wrote out like my text for our questions, and I'm like, but there are spoilers. Yeah, I feel like a, a lot of what I want to talk about is in the spoiler discussion. So let's let's, let's move on. Yeah. Yeah, let's move on. So what did you think of uh, part two? So it was amazing. It's not it's not a modest movie. It's not a shy movie. It's like just it's filmmaking on just such a grand scale. It's an epic scale. There's a quote. I don't remember who said it and it was in parody or what, but like this is cinema, right? This is just an unapologetic blockbuster. I don't Martin know. If Scorsese. It's, exactly. Exactly. Perfect. I don't know if it's like a cultural event on the same level as Endgame and if it will seep into the consciousness as much, but that's hard to achieve. But it's just really, it's just mind blowing. I really, I love cinematography. I love film making. And what this film did for me, I was really blown away by the cin- cinematography of Greg Frazier, playing with color and light, different environments. And I have to avoid spoilers, but it's just fantastic. Yeah, bringing up the end game thing, I think it's on that same like cultural relevance because the amount of memes I've seen on threads, because that's practically the only social media I actively check is threads and then TikTok at night is the Stilgar memes is I see that everywhere. But but yeah, I, I really liked part two. I think I think it surpasses part one in some oh, ways. Interesting. Uh, and that's partially because I think part one's weakness was that i think it was just trying to be a setup movie Mm -hmm. it wasn't trying to be like oh this is the complete story and i think that's what makes part two like really work is it's two halves of a whole i I think everyone does well character wise i think even austin butler and christopher walken do well (laughs) though i thought they would just do what they're known for austin butler coming in with an elvis voice (laughs) <laughs> and just taunting Timothy Chalamet and then Christopher Walken and be like, my doom, my arrakis, my <laughs> That's what I thought the movie was going to be like. But no, they take them very seriously, which I really appreciated. Obviously, Florence Pugh is great. I wish she got a little bit more screen time than she did because they. I feel like the marketing was really hyping her character up to be like, oh, this is like the big central character. Mm-hmm. And it, even Denis talks about her being... At, on equal footing as Chani, as to how Chani was used in part one. And I just felt, oh, not really. Mm-hmm. They don't really use her as much as they do in part one, m- meaning Princess Ar- Aralon. Yeah. Uh, and if I mispronounce anything, y'all, just look, I'm going to mispronounce it. Yeah, same here. I will make many mistakes. We talked about this in the free show. And- yeah. D- just be ready. We're trying. We're trying really hard. <laughs> these Some of these things are really hard to pronounce. If you only hear me say Denis, that's why. The um, director. The director. The protagonist. <laughs> but the only major knock I have against it, and I think I'll get the, into it, the specifics, um, specifically in spoilers, but I really feel like this was the first Denis movie I would have knocked 30 minutes off of. Oh, that's um, interesting. Because there are subplots that don't get the room to breathe that they desperately need. There's a late third act twist that I'm not going to spoil. That is a pretty huge revelation. And it's just, oh, yeah, that it's mentioned and it's done. Yeah. And But it has bigger I, implications going forward. And I was going to have a lot of stuff attached sure. going sure. forward for I guess Doom Messiah. That moment would have gotten a bigger thing. Yeah. And there and specifically where I thought it'd end isn't where it ends. It goes mm-hmm. on for another 30 minutes after that. And I'm like, I don't need to see these last 30 <laughs> minutes. I feel like these last 30 minutes you pop into the next Dune movie and they work spectacularly to kick off the movie. Especially given how part two starts. But yeah, that's the only knock I have really against it. Everyone does really well. New characters do really well. Cinematography, I saw this on IMAX. I think I also have a gripe with the cinematography. Because, of course, I do. I'm a cynic. Um, (laughs) No, I need to hear this. I'm so curious. I hate the filmed for IMAX versus filmed with IMAX mantra. Because I even had an online argument about this on a Discord server. If, if, If I 
if something is filmed for IMAX, in my head, I'm going, oh, this is like meant to be seen in IMAX. This mm -hmm. is going to take full advantage of the entire screen. The I forget what the entire aspect ratio is for yep. true, quote unquote true IMAX. But this entire movie not wasn't in IMAX. There were scenes where it goes down to, I, I think what would be the letterboxed uh, yep. aspect ratio. And I'm like, dude, come on. I, people are paying extra for this. If you filmed it with IMAX cameras, just fill up the whole screen. Yep. I don't get, was, go ahead. That was an intentional choice too, especially with, with Dune part one. And I think from what I read in part one, the director made the choice to film interior scenes, not in IMAX. And all of the exterior scenes were filmed with, with the IMAX gear. And I think part two, there was more IMAX stuff in it than part one. Yeah, I, I guess the thing that frustrates me the most is there's this like huge epic battle and you see an IMAX and mm -hmm. you're like, oh, wow, this is great. And then the next scene, you see a shot of a desert mouse. And then it's like... The Maudib, right? Yeah, the Maudib. And it's just, dude, come on. Why am I seeing this in letterbox ratio? I, I can literally see the sand all around <laughs> me. Like, it's not there's something you need to be doing to make it work. I know it's a, like a minor complaint, but when when IMAX tickets are like $18, yep. I, I don't feel like that price was particularly justified. I, I love Greg Frazier or Greg Frazier. Um, I'm not sure how to pronounce it. I know, I know how it's spelled, but. Yeah, I love his cinematography and everything he's done. I just question the use of the language like filmed for IMAX versus mm -hmm. filmed with IMAX because I legitimately thought when I said when it said I forget if it's this filmed for IMAX or filmed with IMAX mm -hmm. but I was expecting something similar to Oppenheimer where it's like yep. whole screen so I That's was a bit to let down and I think it's it's also why precision matters in language and communication you went in expecting something and you didn't quite get that bill of goods yeah, and it's just it's just a nitpicky thing for me, along with the the thing being the pacing being a little a bit off. Yep. But other than that, those are small things that I think really don't knock it too much. I'm not gonna knock it down to a two star because oh, it didn't <laughs> use the whole screen or oh, it it didn't end when I thought it would end. I'm I think I go ahead. I'm so reluctant to give anybody two stars because it's so hard to get a movie made. I feel like for me, the bare minimum is 2.5 stars. You completed this thing. You got through it. Congratulations. I've rated two movies one star this Ooh. year. Um, what, not to get too off track, but I am curious which ones. The 2024 adapt adaptation of Mean Girls from the Broadway musical. <laughs> <laughs> which I saw yesterday, and then the Jennifer Lopez, This Is Me Now. Oh. Uh, which technically isn't a movie, but it's long enough to be a movie, so I'm counting it. it. It's like a weird video. that I, yeah. I watched that too, and I reviewed it, and I, it was an experience, and very experimental, that's the best way to put it. And not a good one. Not there you go. <laughs> um, but yeah, it Look, I, I get it takes a lot of, for these movies to be made, and I don't knock anybody for trying. I, I think I talked about Alcande uh, giving that a two and a half star or two stars or something like that. I not I love audacious attempts at like swinging for the fences. Sometimes it just doesn't work. But yep. with all that preamble said, obviously I'm rating this five stars. Obviously, obviously. Uh, Obviously. I agree. <laughs> Even though I don't like stars or rating things, which yeah. is weird. And I'm going to actually, I'm going to ask you this question because I did not see, I'm just going to jump right ahead and, and steer it here. So how do you think the director's direction compares to part two compared to part one, besides the stuff that we talked about? The direction, I think, is a lot clearer this time around. It felt Denis was dancing around, oh, I can't adapt this part of the novel yet because that has to be held off for part two. And it just felt like he was holding back a lot. Mm -hmm. Great movie. I think I even rated it at four or five stars when I reviewed it. 
but I think he's learned a lot from part one's mistakes, mm-hmm. particularly in how to write characters. I don't want to say write, just the way he utilizes characters feels a lot more organic this time around. It's not uh, forced. Yeah, it, there are parts in part two that feel a lot more organic. There are moral quandaries being had. Whereas in part one, it's, like, hey, we need to do this thing. We're doing the thing. Okay, we've done the thing. What are we going to do now? We're just going to wander to the desert for a little while. Okay. I'm sure it would make more sense if I read the novel to get some more backstory because I do know things were cut out of part yeah. one and part two. And But I just felt like he's grown up and since part one and really just said, okay, let's just make the most audacious thing possible. Apparently, that's the word of the day, audacious. Yeah. I was just uh, thinking that. <laughs> because he just allows himself to do, oh, yeah, they think I'm going to end here. No, I'm going to go further. <laughs> I'm going to go further. I'm going to explore this world deeper. Even to the point in part two where he's changing significant story arcs yep. in, uh, of characters in the book from what I've heard. Even just from what I've remembered of the 1984 movie, he's, okay, obviously this character can't do this because this is ha- when be how the character acts he's also just allowing himself to start to creep into that global conflict mm-hmm. a little bit and just say yeah i'm this is the next star wars let's go i hope but yeah i think that answers the question it does i think so. and i think with adaptations especially just one note on all of that like it's really it's a difficult thing because if you're maybe not as experienced at writing or directing, which I'm not saying he isn't, you might feel like you need to include everything in the book, everything in the books one-to-one. But I think with experience, you give yourself and gain the wisdom that you have the permission to make a better story, to do things that are in service of this grander vision. And from what you said, it sounds like maybe he gained that perspective with part two. Yeah, I I feel that part one was very interior. Just let's explore the Atreides family, what they're like. Let's get this set up so that when we, if we do get green lighted for our part two, we can expand on, okay, who really are these characters when they're forced outside of their comfort zone, when everything they know is gone and they have to relearn everything. Do you believe that there was ever really a chance? Because after the first movie came out, there was a lot of talk. He did a lot of interviews saying, we, we may not get a part two. Do you believe that was actually ever a reality or if it was just to drum up maybe hype? Because there's been some of that with this one, right? They've talked about, or he's talked about, I don't know if we're going to do a third when it's going to happen. And I feel like we've seen this before. Yeah, I think it, it's a multifaceted answer. I think it's a yes and no. I think it's a yes. He clearly was like, goading warner brothers and hey i just this might not be successful but i left you on a massive cliffhanger that everyone (laughs) wants answered and he did it again in part two to leave room for dune messiah as i'm I'm told that's what's coming next (laughs) i don't know anything about the books other than what i've researched Um, and just what we saw in this little that that the twist right that we'll talk about in the spoilers yeah and then the no part of it is, I think, with you don't have that financial stability that you would have with an Avengers Endgame mm-hmm. or something like with a big budget film where it's this established franchise. Yes, I know there were other incarnations of Dune, but it's long. This book has long been considered unadaptable for a long period of time since it came out. That. Anytime someone would mention a film adaptation, they're like, oh, you absolutely can't do it. It's too massive in scope. Mm-hmm. So I think it was him also voicing concerns of, hey, if this doesn't make money at the box office, we can't make a part two because Warner Brothers won't let us. And I think that's the same thing here. Oop, knock my microphone. <laughs> yeah, and I, I just want to throw this out there. I think I saw the figure, and again, it's Hollywood accounting. You don't know what's actually real or what's being used. But I saw that like, Dune Part 2 needs to make $500 million to break even. I think it's doable with the global market, but we'll see. It's already made, I say made in the sense of... That's off the first it, thing. It's yeah. I think the last count I saw was $187 million worldwide. That's a healthy um, chunk. Yeah. If you've got to get to 500 I know people who still haven't seen it. 
I imagine all the Dune Part 2 memes are going to... I, I don't like memes forcing people to see things, but I think it's going to work here where everyone's going to feel that sense of FOMO, fear of missing out, that they're just going to be like, okay, we have to see Part 2. Yeah. Otherwise, we get spoiled on the internet because this is the timeline we live in. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think So anyone but you, which I adored, got like $208 million at the box office. I, I feel like there's a really good chance for two. <laughs> yeah, I think... 200, 300 is easily within the thing's grasp. I saw like a report saying 800. Either way, I think you sent me an article yesterday mm -hmm. that was talking about Hans Zimmer and how he, before the movie was even out, he plopped Dune Messiah on, on his tour. desk. Yeah. And was just like, start reading, start writing <laughs> the music for this because we're not done. I definitely think regardless of box office receipts, I think it's Dune Messiah is getting made. Heck, the letterbox profile is already up for Dune Messiah. <laughs> that, that's a pretty healthy indicator to where I think, going back to your question about Denis maybe baiting people into, hey, maybe we don't know if we're going to get a part two. For those who don't remember, Dune 2021 came with opening tiles, Dune part one, and mm -hmm. this is Dune part two. So it's okay. I think that's always in the plan to do Dune part one. Yeah. Then maybe while filming part two, he's like, okay, we got to do a Messiah. Yep. So. So, yeah. I know we're moving right along with our chat and we're going on to side quests, but that's okay. Yeah. Do you want to... So, I know we have much more to talk about. I know we have a lot of the acting to talk about, too. Uh, yeah. Talking about in the spoiler or general discussion? General discussion, too, right? I think. Yeah. It's up to you. Whatever yes. you think is... So I think Rebecca Ferguson did a lot better job this time around. Rebecca Ferguson was, I think, no, I was just going to say her performance was like meek, it, yeah. just orbiting around Paul and just trying to make sure he's ready for what comes next. But in this one, she's very much, no, you will do what I say because I am this person now and... I have for I don't want to get into spoilers, but there are things that happen <laughs> with her in part two and that really make her like, no, I am my own character now. Same with Timothy Chalamet's Paul Atreides. He's more like, oh, let me learn the ways of the desert. And then by the end of it, yeah, things happen and he really turns into a a beast of an actor. I'll just say that. I uh, yeah. chills on my sleeve when he's giving a certain speech towards the end of the movie i think yeah he's become so much more of a confident actor and i think that happens as you age and you take on more roles and i thought he was okay before in other things i've seen him in but when you're going to be speechifying you have to have a certain gravitas you have to have you can't just phone it in you have to inhabit the role and i think i think he does that here and certainly, I'm doing a Royal Pains rewatch instead of watching other things. And he was in Royal Pains, and he's totally grown since Luke in Royal Pains when he was, what, a young kid. Yeah. Yeah, and I think, I think that's a large part of him taking a lot of roles that I think really yeah. challenged him. Yeah. We'll leave Wonka out of this. Wonka challenges, I, well, I think there's something to be gained from any role you take, right? And I think that the the musical Willy Wonka, there's a lot more stuff going on there, though it's similar to action and choreography. There's just a lot of things that you might not get to do normally. Yeah, but yeah, he was great in Bones and all. Was that 2019, 2020? Some... I will tell you shortly, because I'm going to look it up. It does not feel like part one came out three years ago. But yeah, I, I yep. think he really did the work between parts of Dune really say okay i need to take serious roles of and not even just serious roles just things that challenged him yeah and i think had, go ahead he had don't look up in between then and he had like some voice acting things so there was definitely a lot of stuff yeah i think same for rebecca ferguson i feel like at least i might be <laughs> we've talked about this we've talked about how we, we want to do just a rebecca ferguson podcast because dr sleep and I, 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 people need to watch that. I've favored it more over the years. 
as the more years I get away from that movie, I need to watch it again. But she was robbed in Dead Reckoning, Mission Impossible <laughs> Dead Reckoning. But that was but, not my spoiler. It, 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 talk about that. Spoiler for Mission Impossible. But yeah, spoiler for Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning streaming now on Paramount. Yeah, she dies. And yeah. it's just, I know she had probably obligations with Dune Part 2 that in, interfered, but laziest character death since, oh, hell yeah, I'll ghoul in Dark Knight Rises. Oh, that's a fair comparison, I think. That's also been a while out. I really love her. I think I love Silo, as I've said before, and I guess she was filming that at the same time as Dune. I don't know how that all works, but... That, that is such a gritty role. It's such cool science fiction and it's on Apple TV plus and there's going to be a season two. So like you can watch and get into season one and not worry about it ending at a cliffhanger without ever being uh, filled. Sorry, Netflix. So there's a lot of good stuff there. Yeah, but I need to see that. I It's, it's funny because I wait for Apple TV plus shows to end or reach their season finale, except for all mankind for whatever reason. Well, that's a really good um, show. It's, the last season was iffy. Oh, but, uh, we need to talk about that. Not today, but. Yeah, another time. Uh, we, we could have <laughs> add, a it to, add it to the list. Yeah. It, when it hits Blu-ray, we'll talk about For All Mankind again. Um, please renew for season five, regardless. Um, but yeah, because I know people are concerned about that. But anyways, <laughs> I will watch Silo. I just need to open up Apple TV uh, Plus and watch that because i'd been meaning to same with the big door prize and stuff like that don't watch Um, hello tomorrow because apparently no one remembers it and it's probably not going to get a season two even though it was really cute look i'll watch anything with billy crudup (laughs) that's fair except for apparently the morning show i just remembered he's in that i haven't watched a single episode but but yeah i maybe just start starring roles for him but yeah but I guess moving on to, I know I already talked about Austin Butler, mm-hmm. Florence Pugh, Christopher Walken. I would love to hear your opinions on the new characters. I'll start with Christopher Walken because that was also a fun impression earlier. For me, it's hard not to see Christopher Walken as Christopher Walken, even though he's approaching this with a lot of seriousness and all the heft that you want to approach. The Emperor role, the known universe and all that, he's still Christopher Walken. I think more of the chameleon for me, and I don't know if it's because he's young and it hasn't been typecast, although that's probably not the right word, is Austin Butler. I thought he was great. I thought he inhabited Fade. I think that's, I don't know if it's method acting, reportedly it was a method actor for Elvis. I don't know. But he was just so creepy and so believable as being so creepy. And I think that was so elevated by everyone just working to make this movie from the costumes and the makeup. and your the cinematography just it was really interesting i just keep thinking about the duel i can't talk about because it's a spoiler um yeah that it uh, yeah i thought he he fit in very well yeah i uh, well i can't talk about that scene can i um we're gonna have to do a part two spoiler podcast i think this is our non-spoiler podcast yeah probably um but there's a I, it's in the trailer. It's in the trailer um, <laughs> where he like licks a knife. I was like, dude, yep. what are you doing? So in the creepy. best way, not not in the worst way. Not in the, what are you doing? But what are you doing? And it fits with his character, right? It's not tonally out of place. It's not just a random thing. Like it, it, that, yes, that character would do that weird thing and you believe it. Yeah. And there's this, there's this, Look, he gives somebody. I won't say who. Because <laughs> was it the improvised thing? No, but that's a good uh, thing to call out. But there's a scene. I can't say where. I'll just say he gives a look to somebody, and I'm like, "Holy cow!" He is doing so much with zero eyebrows, like just so much forehead acting. Just like there's a look where he's like, a look of surprise he gives towards the end of the movie, where I'm like, "Dude." Like cow, that says so much with without him even speaking a word. He's really good at that for whatever reason. Austin Butler. I think it's why he's done. He keeps getting cast in things, right? He's in Masters of the Air. He just 
he's an expressive actor. He's a very talented actor. And I think that's why he gets these roles. Yeah, he's going to be in the Bike Riders this summer. Yes, I know the trailer just got released and people were very excited. I think it's releasing in July. I'll be interested to see that now that it's switched from, I believe it was Searchlight to Focus. Something like that. But yeah, Butler does great. I, I think Christopher Walken here reminds me of a mix of his seven psychopath character and Jungle Book 2016. Wow. Because there's scenes where he's just sitting on his throne like this. And I'm like, oh, that's like the orangutan from Jungle Book right there. And then there's scenes where he's just in delightful glee at something horrible that has just happened. Like something that could mess up his entire plans. And he just laughs the whole time, which reminded me of Seven Psychopaths. I'd be interested to see if he shows up in the third film i don't yeah, think he spoiler, will i don't know we'll, we'll talk about that but yeah i guess that's all i think i have to say about non-spoilers cool uh, do we want to get into spoilers because i feel like that's a lot of what we have to say all right so now let's talk spoiler for dune part two if you haven't seen dune part two take your headphones off like this turn the podcast off <laughs> just come back when you've watch the movie whether that's months from now whether it should be months. tomorrow yeah it should be tomorrow we need to see doom messiah be like that viral threads post and where denny is asking for oh, I, i'll have to put it in the show notes but somebody wrote, like did a joke uh, meme of denny asking people to buy 10 more imax tickets so that dune messiah could get made <laughs> um on a sad note, it's so there's a meme going around Twitter or whatever. I guess that the artist formerly known as Twitter now about Coyote versus Acme, which has reportedly been scrapped. And people are like, if everyone just buys one share of Warner Brothers, maybe we can convince them to to do release the movie. Yeah, or just release it on Max. I feel like that's the easiest way. But tax breaks. <laughs> yeah, a whole nother discussion. Yeah, a whole nother discussion I, that I feel like we need to have. I could talk for three hours about that. <laughs> but yeah, if you haven't watched Dune Part 2 or if, it, it, and it, or and if you care about spoilers, stop listening now. Otherwise, let's talk spoilers for Dune Part 2. Yay. The big question, I think, I guess one of the big questions. You've read the books, right? The first one, not the remaining five. Having read the book, do you think there were any surprises or changes from the source material for you that really changed your outlook on how different part two was from the actual book? Or did it add it add to the narrative or weaken it? So there were some uh, pretty big things. So Count Fenric, pronouncing it wrong, wasn't there. But his leather-clad wife was tempting, tempting fate. And I think that really worked for, for his story and worked within his character's arc as this, uh, not final test, but as this, as this time, mm -hmm. Aaliyah Treaties, which were spoilers, so we can talk about it, is different to the water of life exposure is there, but it's different in the books than it is here, or in the books than it is here. We only see this glimpse of her played by Anya Taylor-Joy. In, in I guess the future and then most of our thing is like this telepathic creepy baby communication in the womb which is an interesting way of handling it and can I talk about that for a second <laughs> specifically so everyone can hear my thoughts on it yo fuck variety for spoiling that yes I was just on my phone looking at emails I get emails from variety I subscribe to some of their newsletters and I saw this on my phone Weeks before I could see yep. part two. What are you doing? Yep. Variety, get out of here. Quit the game. Just go and to an awards only website or something. I, you, your critics consistently spoil major events of a film, whether there be Marvel, DC, whatever. It's abhorrent at this point. Get it's out of not, the game. Yeah. It's not the first time they've done it, like you mentioned. And I want to think. I don't know. Is it possible that they have permission and the okay to do this? Or are they just really that tone deaf? I think it's the second answer. 
I think it's <laughs> they are really that tone deaf because I don't see I didn't see Anya Taylor Joy tweeting about it. I didn't see anyone else. Even though she was at the premiere and she's in in this get up that you're there's going to be coverage of. Yeah. I feel like photographers were told, hey, yes, you can take Anya Taylor Joy's photo. Don't say why she's here. Yep. Support you. Yeah, you could just say, hey, the Anya Taylor Joy makes a surprise appearance at the Dune Part 2 premiere. Anyways, it, unless it needs to be said again, I'm going to clip this and call it Fuck Variety or something like that because, <laughs> wow. C- that was censored. A, no. Yeah, yeah. In American fiction, which I'm also recording a podcast of this week. But anyways, yeah, so that's interesting to hear. So the Water of Life function, d- it functions differently? How is that? The exposure to her, like, I think, she's born ahead of before she's exposed to the water of life i don't quite remember i'm gonna to have to look it up but I, it just from what i remember it's very different than it is in the book i think the function is still the same you still get it's only women it's still millennia of pain and wisdom but i think it it awakens like her differently and her consciousness differently would you say the sleeper has awakened no oh no. For anyone who doesn't get that reference, that's a line that Kyle MacLachlan makes in the middle of the desert, standing with Chani. He just (laughs) screams at the top of his lung, the sleeper has awakened in the middle of Arrakis. The sleeper has awakened. Okay. (laughs) All right. But yeah. yeah, We're meant um, to think that's very significant. Yeah. But yeah, in the 84, I almost said 84 book, 84 film by Lynch, I remember the pregnancy being pretty rushed. Yeah. I don't even think they cover the mother reverend stuff or reverend mother. I think she's born in the book. Yeah. She is born by the, she's the one who kills the Baron. She's the one who does it and walks around creepy blue eyes and all that. So that's a very, I think I, that's the only significant change I noticed. I know Chani has changed Mm -hmm. because i remember in the 84 like i want to say book why do i want to say 84 book maybe because 1984 was a book that could be but in the the different book though different (laughs) yeah but in the lynch film i know chani is much more of a like pacifist he just goes along with what paul does and she's a fighter here and she's very much like that she's very much not that not the antithesis of faith and prophecy but she she's the embodiment of what you need to do to get what you want yeah and and yeah she just she's given more agency i think yeah just in general which is delightful in this movie though the women have a a lot more agency i think but that's another question yeah I, i that perfectly brings me to my next question like how what did you think of the arcs for paul lady jessica and other key characters, did they get more fleshed out stories for the supporting characters? What did you think of the arcs for each I think, character? I think for the women, they got more brought to the forefront of the movie. They were more uh, fleshed out. And I think it was like a counterbalance to the the whole Messiah, White Savior narrative. I think it worked. I, I read that there's going to be a TV show for the women, but that was quite a long time ago. And I don't know if this Dune Sisterhood thing is still happening and he was going to direct the pilot and write the pilot. And I don't know if that's something still in the pipeline. I thought that, I just thought it was a really wonderful balance for these three characters. Yeah, I, there's a line Chani has where, and it's in the trailer, where it's like this prophecy is how they enslave us. And I think giving her that power to just say, no, I'm going to call you out on your bullshit is just such, it works a lot better because I think and same with Lady Jessica now the Reverend Mother that they're given a lot more agency to say no or yes do this thing or because I think a large part of the Dune narrative that I've seen over part one and part two is the poisoning of Paul's mind by those around him poisoned by Chani if you do if you go south there will be a war, right? Holy war. Yeah, there will be holy war and you won't be the same person. You've got to promise me you stay the same person. He's being poisoned by his mom, the Reverend Mother, Lady Jessica, by 
you've got to go south and drink the water of life because you are Lisan al Ghib. He's being poisoned by Stilgar, everyone around him. Just so I think that's given a lot more authenticity by saying, by Chani being that sounding board for Paul. Not only the sounding board, but literally at the end, she won't kiss the ring. Like she, she is appalled by what he's essentially become after he's vanquished isn't the right word for the, for the emperor or Mr. Christopher Walken. She, he's neutralized him when just, she's not having any of it. And I think that will be interesting as that diverges more from how the books are. And where we go with that, because Zendaya is such a powerful actress, it will be really cool to see them take full advantage of that. Yeah, and I feel like that's where they're heading anyways, with her at the end just being the only one that stays behind, essentially. So I know you said that you didn't read the book, but do you think, do you feel like you got really grounded in the world building? Like, do you think that this was a really fleshed out science fiction universe. This is going to be one of my other cop out answers. Yes and no. Yes, in the terms of, I feel like I got more of a sense of Arrakis and Getty Prime and some of the supporting characters. However, no, because I feel like I don't think we get enough time with some things like uh, there's a line of, the houses have denied your ascendancy and don't get an outside perspective at all in this movie other than the emperor and princess Arulan and a few other named characters. I really wish we had seen, okay, outside of the emperor, outside of all this imperial conflict, what do the other houses think about Paul? Like what, I feel like there is some things that are missing from that overall narrative, that, that line about these houses have uh, declined your ascendancy, it would have been much more powerful seeing that because I feel like if you're leading into a holy war against these other houses that deny his ascendancy, it would have been better to see the houses talk about the, what's happening on Arrakis or, you know, I, I don't know if that's in the books, but... I, I would have loved to see something where we get clued in very early on that other people are vying for the throne and other people are trying to usurp the emperor. Again, I wonder if that's something we're going to see as time goes on after we've spent our time in, in the deserts and see it more on these ships and see it more with people who are in the other houses that are not fans of his ascendancy. I, it, I find it interesting too, because I think that this is very much a story of Paul tor from other perspectives, not so much from his perspective. We're seeing him how Chani sees him. We're seeing him at the very start of the film. There's these letters, there's Princess Ireland. We're seeing how she thinks about him and how she's intrigued about him. And I do think there's room for more of the houses, for more perspective on it. Like he, it's almost as if he's not driving the ship. Everyone else is like centered on him, and but I don't know. I didn't phrase that very well. No, I think that made me think about like Princess Ireland's role is really expanding outside of the Emperor. What do other people think about Paul, and why are this? Why is this story so centralized on Paul, and things like that, where you really get a larger scope of things? Yeah, it's the Marsha, but it's Paul. But yeah, I think, yeah, I just would love to see that because, and maybe it was a, like a time constraint where mm -hmm. Denis was like, I can't make this movie a four hour movie. Um, Unless because, you're the director of Napoleon or the director of Rebel Moon and get your special cut. I feel like Denis has earned a three hour, three and a half hour movie. I'll just say that because, yeah, I just felt regarding the pacing I was talking about earlier, about a little bit more later, but. Yeah, it, I just felt like a four-hour movie of this would have been better. But anyways, I'll talk about that a little bit later. But yeah, let's. Do we want to talk about the the universe? Do you are you do you mean like the themes or do you mean uh, because I know like we we talked in the like in our chat a little bit. I know you had a lot of things you wanted to share about the themes because I know they really were interesting to you. And yeah, so this 
movie expands more on what I loved from part one, which was the, and they even say it in the movie, religious fundamentalism and the fanaticism that I think was hinted at in part one, right when Paul and Jessica arrive on Arrakis, they start calling out Lazana just because the Bene Gesserit has planted that idea over thousands of years on Arrakis. It's been um, a lo- long con of, of manipulation and, and Stilgar, Stilgar believes it, right? He, he totally believes this is the guy. Yeah, there's that meme out there where it's, I even shared one where I was like, when airdrop works on the f- first time, uh, <laughs> and it's a, a frame of Stilgar staring in disbelief, because airdrop does not work all the time. It does it, not, no. Uh, um, but yeah. you're sitting right next to it. It's- My MacBook is not even five feet away. <laughs> yeah. Anyways, but yeah, I, I feel like it expanded on more on that. Even getting to the point where Reverend Mother has tattoos all over her face, and mm-hmm. the more you get into the film, the more um, jewelry and things she has on her. Even to the point where she rides a sandworm in this little pod thing, like a I forget what they call it in the Middle East, but there's the, this this um, thing you would put on an elephant. It's not, um, I know what you mean, but I can't think of the name either. It's not a saddle. Yeah, yeah it's not a saddle. They'd have like four poles running through it. Anyways, it's the, the Dune equivalent of that. And you really start to see what is the dangers of just believing in something so blindly that you won't even see any alternative. Like Stilgar, again, we're going to talk about Stilgar a lot. Um, <laughs> Javier Bardem. He, yeah, Javier Bardem, because he's at the core of this re- religious uh, fanaticism. He's helping um, Paul convince himself in some ways. Yeah, because he says to Paul after he's, I'm not the list on all guys, but he just denies everything. I just know this thing because I've been fighting Harkonnens thousands of years. And he's, it was so characteristic of the Lisan al Gaib to be so humble or whatever he says. And it's, oh, you're just that blinded by this prophecy that you're willing to. And I guess this is where the Star Wars parallels come in. You're so blinded by there are so many. Sorry for all the Dune fans out there. I got to mention it. It as a Star Wars fans, I see it. So um, oh, look, so the the hero's journey, universal storytelling. There's some stuff that you're going to hit upon with every big epic story that you're bringing to screen. Yeah, and they're so the Jedi Council believes so much in this prophecy. Everyone believes in so much of this prophecy that it blinds them to what's really happening and what happens at the end of the film, which is the spark that ignites the holy war. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I just. Yeah, I love that part of it. I, that's the major improvement from part one, I see, just from the narrative standpoint. Do you, do you think the ending was satisfying, or did you, was there more that you wanted? No, because it felt too much like part one's ending, because part one famously ends with uh, Chani saying to Paul, this is only the beginning, and then credits, doing part one. Uh, it doesn't even say Dune Part 1 anymore. It says just Dune, which is confusing given the opening credits are Dune Part 1. Anyways, I, I, I re- can you tell I rewatched Dune Part 1 recently? That's but, a valid thing, though, and it, it, it is strange considering how Dune Part 1 was, th- that promise was there. Yeah, and then Part 2 ends very much in the same way of, I believe, I forget which character is talking about it, but talking about this holy war starting. I, I can't remember it's, if it's the uh, Reverend Mother Jessica or, oh, what's the name of the baby? Um, not, not Aaliyah. Not Aaliyah. Or Aaliyah? I think that we're, I think it's Aaliyah. Okay. I'll take, I, I, I don't read character sheets. Anyways, it's either Lady Jessica or not Aaliyah? It's like A-L-I-A. Okay. I think. Either of those two characters say this is the spark that ignites the Holy War, some variation of mentioning a Holy War starting, and then slam the credits. And the thing that I was going to mention earlier, but couldn't because spoilers, was I thought the speech that Paul has right after drinking the water of life, going into that mosque. When was everyone is gathered. To, and he yeah, when everyone was gathered. You would do the the knife raise, and that would be it, mm-hmm. right? That would be the slam to credits. 
because that makes more sense to me because I don't, for me, again, I'm coming at this from the mind mindset of I've seen the Lynch film and basically that's it, right? Yeah. That film treats the usurping of the Emperor Shaddam IV and the killing of the Baron as this like climactic action. Mm -hmm. That is the end of the movie. So I was like, okay, I'm looking for something different. That That is the end goal that you're going to. I don't know anything about a holy war other than what's been teased in Dune Part 1. And then stuff that happens in Part 2 where it's like, oh, I if I go south, I might ignite the holy war. Yeah. So I was expecting that part where he raises the knife in the middle of the mosque and says, gives all these intricate details to this guy about how his mom died by the, her being her head being bashed in by a rock or something. Yeah. I thought that was going to be the end because it's like, this is the moment that proves this is Lisan Al-Gaib, which is just what... Kept, Go ahead. They just kept putting the button on it and putting the button on it and just... There wasn't a clear moment to stop almost. Yeah, because part one very much teases that like, no, like once Paul turns into Lisan Al-Gaib, that is the... Like, turning point for the entire story so i was like okay that's going to be the button that's going to be the bow that wraps part two up so when it keeps going for another 30 minutes after that i'm like <laughs> dude what are you doing i have another 30 minutes that's fine but i would rather that 30 minutes be spent elsewhere let's build up fade rotha um let's build up princess arlan build up emperor shaddam the fourth all these new characters because we do have some significant time skipping in this in the start of this movie and yeah. in, in the start of part two. And it's just, like, whoa, 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 I need to see that because that's like a because the ending of part two is very much is Paul going to reject Chani and just become the totally evil person uh, that she fears she, he could be and just be like everyone else. Or will he stay true to himself? and actually give Fremen the ability to rule over themselves, over Arrakis. Interestingly, um, about Chani, there's this moment in this, I do know this about Dune Messiah, that, and, you know, in relation to the timeline, so they have a child together, eventually, yeah. in the books. And there's a moment where Chani, I don't know if you were paying attention, like, has this blue, like, the blue thing she puts on her arm, and that means she's pregnant. And I wonder if that is, part of how they're going to have these two characters come crashing into each other again and have us see them together for the rest of that. That's interesting because that the film never explains that. Nope. And it's just a, a book thing. So it's like, that's one of those things that I would expect it to be expanded on. I know it comes later that you see that revelation, but that was even something covered in the 84 movie where once they have sex that's the kid of paul yeah uh, i think leto the second or something like that yeah. but yeah it, it was something covered in the book so i was expecting again expecting that to happen by the end of this so it's, it's yeah that, that was the big problem i had is just it there's stuff i would stuff into those 30 minutes to where dune messiah would start with that spark yeah that ignites the holy war and then you could spend that entire act two and three exploring the galaxy and seeing Paul's Holy War. Yeah. And if they wanted to do, heaven forbid, a fourth Dune movie. <laughs> fourth and fifth and ten more films. Yeah. If they really wanted to expand it, you could go to Children of Dune and stuff like that. Or even just Dune Messiah Part 1 and Part 2. But yeah, I, that would have been my preference. But again, I'm not the editor. Uh, <laughs> and it's very clear that where part two ends is where Dune Messiah will pick off. Yeah. Pick off? Pick up. Pick up. Yeah. Um, is there is there anything final that you want that we didn't talk about to share about Dune or to Gosh, that's I think the big thing for me about Dune Part Two, and maybe I'll cover this in my likely three thousand word review. <laughs> I've got a lot to say about Dune Part Two, mainly talking about religious fanaticism. Yeah. Because it's so core to this movie. But I, I think the only thing I would have to add is I wish that certain things were explained a lot better than they were. Mm -hmm. Because 
like Gurney Halleck. I, yeah. I, 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 Josh I forget that Yeah, like he pops up out of nowhere, and you're just like, <laughs> he's back, hit with his footsteps. Yeah, it, oh, I recognize your footsteps. Or, it's okay. I get that's a callback to part one. Something he told him in part one, but it felt like there should have been a more momentous occasion for mm-hmm. that. I don't know. There may be some backstory because thinking back to part one, I'm like, there's no way he got out of that alive. And in fact, before you see his face, I thought Duncan Idaho made it out alive. Oh. Because I literally said to my mom, who was sitting to my right in the movie theater, is Duncan Idaho back? Is he back? <laughs> and I'm like, if that's Duncan Idaho, man, that's crazy. But then you see Josh Brolin and it's, oh, okay, so how did he survive? And then it just never is explained. I need to make a joke somehow about Thanos being inevitable and, and Josh Brolin being inevitable, but even in Dune, but I don't know if that'll work. He is inevitable, Josh Brolin surviving. Like he, except for he's not in Deadpool three. I so don't know. We'll find out. I'm sure there will be a second trailer in two months. That's here's all the people from Deadpool two, because you'd feel like I don't want to spoil. <laughs> Can we spoil Deadpool two? Sure. I think it's been out for many years at this point. I think it's okay. I feel like I haven't seen it, but that's okay. I feel like Cable would be a lot more upset at Deadpool for fixing his time turner thing to, because that's what happens at the end of Deadpool 2 is he fixes it and goes back and saves X-Force, saves his girlfriend, Vanessa, and basically changes the events. And that's what leads up to Dune, not Dune, <laughs> Dead, Deadpool and Wolverine. Uh, it could but, lead up to Dune. I don't know. We talked about Kung Fu Panda and Dune. Deadpool is totally workable. Yeah, but yeah, I just think I would have loved uh, more backstory with that 30 minutes, even if it's got to be a four hour movie. Yeah. Uh, Because I'll sit in a four hour movie if it makes sense. John Wick, chapter four came out this time last year. That wasn't as long as this, was it? It was over two hours, I remember. Uh, Yeah, I think, I feel like it was pretty long. This Uh, was like an hour. Yeah, sorry. No, you're good. But yeah, Oppenheimer, I think, three hours. Um, John Wick was two hours and 49 minutes. Wow. Yeah, so pretty close, bumping pretty close to that three hours. Yeah. And I think this is pretty close to that as well. And I didn't have any problem with John Wick Chapter 4 because every single thing they did made sense. But in Dune Part 2, there's some things where I'm like, okay, how's Gurney alive? Why weren't we told about X, Y, or Z? Maybe that comes up in Dune Messiah. There's more world building and more questions that need answers. Yeah, but I'll be interested to see that. Yeah, that that's my only complaint, is give me more time in this universe before you start revealing like that Paul isn't actually an Atreides and Lady Jessica isn't actually an Atreides. <laughs> he's a Harkonnen. Yeah, he's a Harkonnen. I feel like that's a big reveal. But it's, it's a huge reveal. Like, Two-minute two scene, maybe? Paul has a water of life and immediately is like, why didn't you tell me you're a Harkonnen? Oh, I didn't know till I took the water of life. Oh, yeah. you didn't know? I feel like you're a Bene Gesserit, and I feel like they have the power to see things like that. But <laughs> Apparently I, I not. I had the books. But yeah, if I had any message to Denis or any of the creative team for Dune Messiah, take your time. I don't need another three, three a year wait. I can go six years. For Dune Messiah, if it means that what you make is properly fleshed out and I'm not feeling like I mess, missed certain elements of the book, not even certain elements of the book, like certain key plot points, because I went back and watched the Screen Crush video yeah. on Dune Part 2 and I'm like, oh, that happened in the book? That happened in the book? Oh, do, do you fear one of the mentats of oh. the Trades is in I, for, I totally forgot he was in the 84 film helping the Harkonnens. But yeah, it, just don't feel like you have to cut things because... And he um, cut things here too, interestingly. And I think he did interviews where he said that it was painful having to cut some of the things that they took out. So I'm curious when the deleted scenes will be released, if they'll add context and add any more... He's not. He, he was asked about that. Uh, uh, I think in the same interview. 
And he's, oh, we get like a director's cut or the deleted scenes or anything like that. And he's, no, I even talked about it on threads. I'm like, dude, just you don't do any editing to the deleted scenes. That's all. literally just hand it off to mm-hmm. their home entertainment team, People. whoever that is. Hand off the deleted scenes. Just pick up the file from Premiere Pro or DaVinci Resolve, export it, do whatever you got to do. Send it into the color grader because I'm sure maybe those scenes don't have color grading on them. Heck, I, some of the Infinity War deleted scenes <laughs> are only like previs. The with, thing with Endgame. One of the best things about buying a movie on on a digital or Blu-ray or whatever is seeing what could have been, <laughs> even if it doesn't make sense. Because, so you could be like, oh, this is like insight into something that could have happened. But I'm glad it didn't happen because besides of X, that, Y, and Z. Besides the idea that no one's going to delete your DVD or Blu-ray. Besides that, yeah. Besides owning it. Because I will say, and this is, I guess, another tangent. Voodoo is changing its name or something like that to Fandango at Home or something. Oh. Voodoo, you are the worst digital movie provider I have ever seen. I went to go look for a certain movie a few weeks back when I saw the name change why oh why are some of my movies that are are compatible with movies anywhere not in my video voodoo uh-huh. library it happened with i believe it was called fandango now as well like i would buy movies and then i wouldn't get any notification they would just delete them yep and i'm like dude i don't want to have to keep purchasing these movies yeah i can only do digital because i don't have the storage space to store movies or yep. um discs so it's anyways but rant aside i hope that dune messiah i feel like i'm talking bad about dune part two i love dune part two i would see it again right now yeah it, it, it was fantastic and i i don't, I don't think you're it's a critical discussion, right? It's a fair discussion of all the the things. So it's not we could sit and say, "I love this movie; it was great." But still, a five star for me. I just have, I'm a nitpicky person. Like I, if certain things aren't explained to me, it frustrates me, mm-hmm. and not in the Mean Girls way of. There's <laughs> literally, and I don't mean to bag on Mean Girls, but it's just what you saw recently, so it's fresh. Yeah. Your- but they literally have a line about, here's the context of this. They say this line in a musical scene and just tell you the context. Here's what happened uh, in, in, this, in, in this backstory of this character. Yeah. And I'm like, that's not what context is. <laughs> that's not. You, it's the classic case of show. Don't Instead tell of us. telling, yeah. So, yeah, I just wish the thing of telling i think stilgar is the one who tells paul that they have rejected your ascendancy yeah and i'm like dude it would be so much cooler if if i had if there was a scene in there where it's like stilgar or whoever sends the message and then you get a reaction shot of each five houses here's uh, send the message we we reject his ascendancy and the interior meetings that they have Yep. Maybe that would make it four hours, but I'm more than willing to sit for <laughs> hours maybe four hours if it makes sense. And I think that's that's a that's a good final note, right? Yeah. Next time, make a longer movie. Yeah, just make a, the movie that is wired. If if a book's eleven hundred pages, make the thing like make that. You don't have to do one to one. Just mm-hmm. make the adaption adaptions where it fits, and then just go home. Yep. Leave it to the editors. You know, just I know they have that thing of kill your babies, but in this situation, I feel like there's 30 minutes on the cutting room floor <laughs> missing, just like in a um, project backup file somewhere, yep. DaVinci or Premiere Pro. And I'm like, dude, just release it. Yep. Release the deleted scenes because <laughs> I need the context. Just give me the context in Doom Messiah. With that said, I think that's a good place to leave off. Yeah. Will we be releasing the de- deleted scene, the uncolor graded scene from the podcast? Yeah, I'll just release this, the whole thing for <laughs> patrons. If that's something y- y'all want to see, I sure. <laughs> It'll just take a lot longer. 
maybe I'll do that. I'll start releasing <laughs> uncut ep episodes. Just here's the whole raw video file. Yeah. But with that said, thank you, all of you, for listening or watching if you're on YouTube. Or you can watch on Spotify, too. Yeah, it's it's weird. Somebody put the whole Five Nights at Mo uh, Freddy's movie up on Spotify recently. Oh, that's... It's still up. Uh, yeah. But uh, Spotify, the Wild West podcast. Um, yeah. But thanks. Yeah, just thanks for listening and watching whatever you're doing. Uh, I've been your host, Austin Belzer. Uh, if you've enjoyed this episode, please subscribe. Leave a rating where applicable. Uh, and review it on your favorite podcast app. If that's a feature in your a podcast app, you can follow me on Austin B Media, Blue Sky, Facebook, Instagram, Mastodon, and Threads. If you're on Letterboxd, I'm on there as Austin B Movies. Isla, where can people find you? So I am, you can find me at movieswetextedabout.com. And I'm also on, on Twitter as T U L I N Rights. And I'm on Letterboxd as the same thing. Awesome. I hope to have you back for maybe Invincible or something like that. Be fun. Yeah, because I, yeah, keep, keep an eye on that, everyone listening and watching. I saw that a while ago, and I'm trying not to spoil it. But, <laughs> but yeah, have a good day, everyone, and thanks for listening.